On behalf of our owners and our staff, it's my pleasure to welcome you. Uh, it's extra special tonight because uh, Jonathan Saffron Four and his mom and dad are here, and uh, we're happy because they're great friends of the store, so it just makes it extra special. Jonathan Saffron Four is the author of three previous works of fiction. Everything is Illuminated, Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close, Tree of Codes, and the nonfiction book Eating Animals. His many honors include the New York Public Library's Young Lions Fiction Award, Granta's Best of Young American Novelists, and The New Yorker's 20 Under 40. Tonight we're here to celebrate the paperback edition of Jonathan's latest novel, Here I Am, the story of a young Washington, D.C. family persevering in the face of matters no less than life and death, peace and war, love and betrayal, and all the responsibilities that come with protecting one's family. All that plus an earthquake and the putting down of a beloved family dog. Dwight Garner wrote in his New York Times Review, Here I Am has more teeming life in it than several hundred well-meaning and well-reviewed books of midlist fiction put together. Maureen Corrigan said on Fresh Air, Dazzling, a profound novel about the claims of identity, history, family, and the borders of a broken world. Uh, thanks for coming, and please help me welcome Jonathan Saffron Ford. <laughs> Um, well, it's very nice to be here. I have been on a paperback tour. Do people know about hardbacks and paperbacks? And <laughs> no, 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 no. I, that's not a joke. I mean, do you know the mechanics of why one comes out when it does? Most people don't. I didn't before I was a writer. So a hardback comes out when the book is first published. Almost always. Now sometimes they will publish, go straight to paperback. But traditionally, um, you finish a book as a writer and then there's some lag of time between the end of writing it or editing it and when it comes out. So when you're a first time novelist, the lag is tends to be long because there's a whole infrastructure that the publisher puts in place um, to try to get people's attention, you know, which is very hard to do for a first time writer. I was going to say this bookstore isn't getting any bigger, but every time I'm here, it actually is getting bigger. But most bookstores don't get bigger. And there are, as time passes, more books that have permanent take up permanent occupation on the shelves. So it's harder and harder and harder to find a place on a bookshelf. Um, so the you know publishing responds by s printing galleys, which are advanced copies of the book that are sent around and trying to just drum up interest in any ways they can. So if you're a first time novelist, it might be a year and a half or it might be two years sometimes between when you finish the book and when it's published. And then about another year elapses between the hardback and the paperback. So um, I finished this book, hello? I finished this book about um, maybe four months before it was published. And when it was published in hardback, I did an event at Sixth and I, and I was really, really quite nervous and I felt very vulnerable and exposed, but I also felt a little bit confused because I was really only the writer of the book, and I, I, I didn't yet have any identity as the as a reader of the book. I didn't. I was too uh, close to it. And now that a year has passed, um, I am both a writer of the book and a reader of the book, um, and it's a nice distance to have. I know as time passes, I will at some point no longer really be the writer of the book at all, and only be a reader of the book, which is my experience when I look back at my previous novels. I know that I wrote them. I know that my name is on them. I feel <laughs> like a autobiographical connection to the author of the books, but I don't, I'm really not joking. I'm speaking seriously. I don't, I don't feel, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't feel it. I don't feel that connection. I had a really strange and kind of lovely experience the other night when I was reading in Pittsburgh and afterwards uh, a woman came up in the signing line, and she was maybe 65, maybe 70, um, and she was there with her mother, who was maybe 90 plus. And um, the daughter and I had a conversation, and she told me some of her reactions to the book and some <coughs> anecdotes, and her mother was just kind of off to the side and had clearly, or it seemed clear to me that she was just brought along and was happy to be there, not unhappy, but was not particularly engaged and was looking all over the place and thinking about other things. And then when the daughter assigned the book and the daughter said, thank you very much, and we shook hands, and the mother said, hold on a minute, I want to see his face. And she got really close to me, Aww. like as close as two faces can be without touching, really, really close, and stayed there for what was probably 
a second or two, but felt like <laughs> an eternity. And she just stared. And then she said, okay. And then they walked off. And it was, I, I loved that experience, as awkward as it was, um, as uncomfortable as I felt while it was happening. Um, I liked her willingness to risk like finding the appropriate closeness to be able to see something properly. And, you know, for different people, different people require different distances for looking at different things. Um, I was in Dallas also this week, and I was at their art museum, and they have a Rauschenberg in the lobby, which um, maybe is, I don't know, 50 feet tall and wide. And even to see it in its entirety, you have to be across a room. And then they have other works of art in the museum, like... Um, a Joseph Cornell box that you have to get within a foot to be able to see properly. And also the distance depends on you. You know, I have, I'm short, uh, nearsighted, so I have to get closer to things than other people do in order to see them properly. And um, it, it's a, a very strange experience to publish a book and that changing distance is very strange. And it's, the distance is also affected by context you know, if you're in a dark room, it's different than if you're in a very bright room. And being in D.C. also affects the distance. So I have done a number of readings, and I think I'm pretty nonchalant about them. But I get very nervous in D.C. and very, like, upset, not in the, not in the sense of um, unhappiness, but in the sense of a kind of stability that is upset, like an, a lack, a restlessness, an emotional restlessness. So... It's catching me at a kind of special moment, being both the writer and the reader of the book, being in D.C., and um, now this is also the last reading of this little paperback tour, so I'm happy to be here. Um, I was in um, Italy around the time that the hardback came out, and I'll tell you a story that I told to a friend who's, who I see here, which is... Um, I was in Italy when the the Italian version was coming out, and we'd have I had a very very busy two or three days, just packed with stuff. And on let's say Monday, my publisher who was with me the whole time said, "Oh, tomorrow on Tuesday, one of the editor uh, one of the uh, interviewers is sick, I think, or maybe he had to go off and cover actual news." Um, <laughs> and so we have two hours. Is there anything that you would like to do while you're in Milan? And I thought about it, and I, th I think I probably Googled what should I do in Milan. <laughs> and uh, I decided that I wanted to see The Last Supper, which I'd seen in reproductions many, many times, but had never seen in person. And he's a very proud, very elegant, maybe 75-year-old Italian man. At my house in Brooklyn, people take off their shoes when they come in because I have been to Japan, and after that trip, I will never think of shoes and indoors the same way. But he's the only person who has ever said no when I said, would you please take off your shoes and you got So that's, that is a good way to like, briefly capture his character. And um, he's, very, he's very proud. And I said, I would like to see The Last Supper. He said, well, to be honest, it's not that easy because you have to have a reservation in advance. You have to have an appointment. But you are a great American author. So I will be able to get you in to see this. And at that point, I didn't even really care about The Last Supper anymore. I was so chuffed by his description of me. And that <laughs> night when I was um, FaceTiming with my kids, as I do when I'm away, I said, hey, guys, not guess who's going to get to see The Last Supper tomorrow, but guess, guess whose dad is a great American author. <laughs> and... Um, the next morning, my publisher met me in the lobby of the hotel, and he said, I have some bad news. Um, you are a great American author, <laughs> but I was not able to get you a reservation to see The Last Supper. But I have some good news as well, which is we can go see. I, I was able to get you. I, I learned out later you don't need a reservation for this. But he said, I was able to get you a reservation to go see Michelangelo's Pietà. And I thought, oh, that's really great. I hadn't even remembered that it was there. And he said, it's not, it's not the... Pietà you're probably thinking of, the good one, <laughs> which is in um, the Vatican. Um, 
but this is another one and we have two hours, so let's go do it. And so we went. Has anybody seen the Pietà in Milan? So it's a very unusual sculpture in a, in a quite unusual setting as well. It's in a gallery all by itself on a pedestal that was the first of its kind designed to, I guess, move with earthquakes. Um, and it's not facing you when you walk in. You're facing its, the back. You have to very, very modestly position and you have to sort of confront it on your own terms. You have to meet it rather than it coming to meet you. And um, it was the last sculpture Michelangelo, Michelangelo ever made. It was the only sculpture he ever made that wasn't commissioned, that he made for its own sake. It's not at all clear if it's finished or not. Um, and the oddest thing is that there are two figures but five uh, arms. And four of the arms are where you would think they would be. It's a mother and child embracing one another. And the fifth is just sort of like this just a little bit off to the side and it's you know connected by marble but just kind of hanging like that you can look at pictures of it later um and i just didn't get it at all and i asked the docent why what was that arm doing there and she said it was um the the at one point in the sculpture's creation there had been three figures or four figures or five figures and this arm was a leftover and in, in art historical terms, there's a, it's called a regret, which is an artifact of a rethinking. And I looked at it, I sort of, like probably everybody who ever visits it does, I put my thumb to you know, see it differently. I said, why didn't you just get rid of it? You know, it's, it looks, I understand why it might have been there in the first place, but I don't understand why it had to be there in the last place. And um, she gave, the explanation, which is so matter of fact that it almost comes full circle to being magical and surreal, which is uh, the, the sculpture would topple if it had been removed. The center of gravity of the sculpture requires that arm to be there, requires that artifact of his rethinking. Um, so I enjoyed that room, that gallery, that setting for another 15 minutes or so. And then as I was walking out, the docent said to me, one of the last things that Michelangelo ever wrote was that my life's greatest regret is that I spent so much of my life working on my art and so little working on my life. I don't know if she was intentionally echoing regret there or not, but I thought about those two different kinds of regret because uh, I was at the beginning of this process of moving from writer to reader, um, from something very intimate to something shared. and. This book has a lot of that first kind of regret, you know, a lot of limbs. I don't know how many people have read it or not, but it has many different styles and many voices. And I have something that happens to me after almost every reading, and it m maybe by saying it, it won't happen tonight, but somebody inevitably comes up and says, I really loved your book, but did there have to be so much? And then there's like five things they can choose from. <laughs> um, I think my mom even had that response to this book. Uh, so did it have to did there have to be that pornographic stuff? Did there have to be that Israel stuff? Did there have to be <laughs> all the bad words? Did there have to be this? Did there have to be so many of these like limbs? And um, there didn't. I could have written the book differently. I wrote my first two books differently. Um, I think my first two books are in, in certain ways more charming, or they're less. They they were they were more interested in showing in having a certain side face forward and another side face backward face face away from the reader and for various reasons having to do with just getting older and probably not seeking evaluations from the world um, but from you know having them be self-generated I was not worried about those things with this book and it really freed me up in a way that doesn't necessarily speak to the quality of the book at all but it speaks to my closeness to the book, which has to do with the second, the second kind of regret. And I would say this was the first book where I didn't feel that, where I felt, it, I felt that I was working on my life while I was working on the book, not in the sense of autobiography, because it, it, I didn't write it that way, and not in the sense of catharsis or therapy, because I couldn't write something that way, even if I thought it was a good idea, which I don't. But a kind of openness to whatever honestly surfaced, you know, from a, a process that was not heavy-handed, that was not um, 
invested in any particular outcome, either in terms of what the book would be about or in terms of how I might express myself and how charming or ugly that self-expression might be. Um, so because the book has so many different limbs and regrets, I happen to like books like that. I like books that show the hand of the maker always. Whenever I encounter a painting or a dance or a song or a book that I really love as opposed to one that I really like, and I really like a lot of things and I really love very, very few things. And I think the difference is all of the things that make a book likable, like that it is entertaining or suspenseful or interesting or thought provoking, or the characters are sympathetic or it moves me. They're all necessary for love, but they're not sufficient. And I think the difference is something that's a little bit hard to describe, but is probably familiar. I hope it's familiar to everybody, which is that feeling of being known. You know, you will at some point in a book, close it for a second and just feel not exposed in a bad way, but known. And that knowing implies a knower. You know, it implies somebody on the other side. It is not the plot that's knowing you. It's not the characters that are knowing you. But you feel suddenly that you're having a kind of intimate, very, very intimate and singular communion with the person who made it. And I find that that experience happens more readily when I really feel the creator's presence, even if that presence is at the expense of a kind of perfection, a kind of craftsmanship. I don't mind if things are run on a little bit too long. I don't mind if certain things are extraneous. Like I didn't mind, I wouldn't be telling the story about the sculpture if I had minded that arm so much. Um, I liked it and I'm talking about it now, even though I'm not talking about any other sculptures or any other paintings or books because um, it meant something to me. And I think it's not a coincidence that this like extreme example of the creator's process and presence um, moved me as much as it did. So because there are all these different parts and limbs, it's a hard book to um, read from because everything feels misrepresentative in the same way that if you only saw that fifth arm without the context of the rest of the sculpture, you wouldn't know anything, you know, or uh, similarly, if you just saw one of the faces or the feet, or if you never bothered to approach the sculpture from the front, but were satisfied with the view that it presented when you walked in, you just wouldn't know anything. And I always worry that when I choose to read a part of the book, I, the reader will know nothing at the end of it. Um, I have a whole bunch of passages. This is the book that I've had since this is the review, review copy of the galley that I've taken around with me since my first reading. And I have a whole bunch of passages and I have the page numbers and a little description of what it is that that passage is about. And before my first reading, I talked about it with my editor and I said, you know, I could read this part about withholding, but then people are going to think it's like a very domestic novel and they're going to think it's kind of quietly tragic and that would just be misrepresentative. So maybe I could read the Spielberg part, which is kind of funny and Jewy and very culturally specific, but that will be misrepresentative of the book and I could do the and so on and so forth. And I said, anything that I would read would, is going to misrepresent this book. And he said, really bless him as my editor and my friend, um, isn't that the kind of book you wanted to write? And he was exactly right, that, that the, the kinds of things I want to make and the kinds of things that I want to encounter as a reader or a listener of music or a, someone who you know, digests art are things that are not easily summarized and are not about all the things that they're ostensibly about, but are create an experience that offers the possibility of, of being known. Um, that having been said, I do have to read something, or I am going to read something. <laughs> so I thought I would read, um, just, the, uh, I should tell you, describe the book. It takes place in Washington, D.C., believe it or not. Um, more or less here. I mean, it's in a place exactly like this with people exactly like you. Uh, and it follows a family through six weeks. Jacob and Julia are a married couple. They're in their very early 40s. Um, and they have three kids, Sam, Max, and Benji. They're parents, they're friends, there's a grandparent. And we follow them through two crises, one of which is 
domestic, which is a cell phone that reveals an affair, and the other is global. It's an earthquake in the Middle East which precipitates a war that becomes so extreme that the Prime Minister of Israel asks all Jews around the world to come fight for Israel's survival. So I'm, I'm only going to read from parts having to do with the first part that I just described, the sort of domestic drama. And I thought I would just do like a very quick survey of this marriage. And um, the first part, which is about three pages, let's say, takes place, um, I describe toward the beginning of the book two visits that the couple make to an inn in Pennsylvania, one right after they're married, one ten years later. And in the second visit, they try to replicate the first one just because it would be sweet and nostalgic and sort of fun. And So they arrive at the time they did in the first visit. They stay in the same room. They order the same dinner. They try to have some of the same conversations, literally, like to replay some of the same lines. And it is really lovely and it is sweet and it does make them nostalgic in a good way, but it also creates a way to measure the distance that they've traveled in the same way that um, a height chart on a wall, which is you'll, you'll hear I mentioned in this passage, does, you know, with children. Like people keep those not only because they're really lovely artifacts, but because you just wouldn't know, you know, the rate of your children's growth without them. I all the time walk down the street and someone will say, oh man, you're, you're gigantic to one of my kids. And I'll think, what are you talking about? He's exactly the same size he was yesterday, which is exactly the same size he was the day before. So having an occasion to measure things can be happy and also painful. So this passage is, goes in fast forward between the two visits. It sort of describes the 10 years of marriage. Okay, water around. Um, okay, Julia became pregnant with Sam a year later, then Max and then Benji. Her body changed, but Jacob's desire didn't. It was their volume of withholding that changed. They continued to have sex, although what had always arisen spontaneously came to require either an impetus like drunkenness or watching blue as the warmest color on Jacob's laptop in bed <laughs> or Valentine's Day or muscling through the self-consciousness and fear of embarrassment, which usually led to big orgasms and no kissing. They still occasionally said things that, thank you, <clears throat> they still occasionally said things that the moment after coming felt humiliating to the point of needing to physically remove oneself to get an unwanted glass of water. Each still masturbated to thoughts of the other. This is now the end of that kind of material, just so you know. Each still masturbated to thoughts of the other. Um, even if those fantasies bore no blood relationship to lived life and often included another other. But even the memory of that night in Pennsylvania had to be withheld because it was a horizontal line on a doorframe. Look at how much we've changed. There were things Jacob wanted and he wanted them from Julia. But the possibility of sharing desires diminished as her need to hear them increased and it was the same for her. They loved each other's company and would always choose it over either aloneness or the company of anyone else. But the more comfort they found together and the more life they shared, the more estranged they became from their inner lives. In the beginning, they were always either consuming each other or consuming the world together. Every child wants to see the marks ascend the door frame, but how many couples are able to see progress in simply staying the same? How many can make more money and not contemplate what could be bought with it. How many, approaching the end of childbearing years, can know that they already have the right number of children? Jacob and Julia were never ones to resist convention on principle, but neither could they have imagined becoming quite so conventional. They got a second car and second car insurance, joined a gym with a 20-page course offering, stopped doing their taxes themselves, occasionally sent back a bottle of wine, bought a house with side-by-side -side sinks and house insurance, doubled their toiletries, had a teak enclosure built for their garbage bins, replaced a stove with one that looked better, had a child and bought life insurance, ordered vitamins from California and mattresses from Sweden, bought organic clothing whose price amortized over the number of times it was worn, all but required them to have another child. So they had another child. They considered whether a rug would hold its value, knew which of everything was best, Miele vacuum, Vitamix blender, Farrowin ball paint, consumed Freudian amounts of sushi and worked harder so that they could pay the very best people to care for their children while they worked harder. And then they had another child. Their inner lives were overwhelmed by all the living, not only in terms of the time and energy required by a family of five, but of which muscles were forced to strengthen and which withered. Julia's unwavering composure with the children had grown to resemble omnipatience, while her capacity to express urgency to her husband had shrunk 
to texted poems of the day. Jacob's magic trick of removing Julia's bra without his hands was replaced by the depressingly impressive ability to assemble a pack and play as he carried it up the stairs. Julia could clip newborn fingernails with her teeth and breastfeed while making a lasagna and remove splinters without tweezers or pain and have the kids begging for the lice comb, but she'd forgotten how to touch her husband. Jacob taught the kids the difference between farther and further, but no longer knew how to talk to his wife. Their inner lives were nurtured in private, and a destructive cycle developed between them. With Julia's inability to express urgency, Jacob became even less sure that he was wanted and more afraid of risking foolishness, which furthered the distance between Julia's hand and Jacob's body, which Jacob had no language to address. Desire became a threat, an enemy to their domesticity. The withholding of sexual needs was the most primitive and frustrating kind of withdrawal, but hardly the most damaging. The movement toward estrangement from each other and from themselves took place in far smaller, subtler steps. They're always becoming closer in the realm of doing, coordinating the ever-expanding routines, talking and texting more and more efficiently, cleaning together the mess made by the children they made together, and farther in feeling. And I will skip ahead to, um, to, to the end, you could say. Not, not quite the end of the book, but... Um, it's, it spoils nothing at all to tell you that they get divorced. It's revealed, I think, in, um, I don't know, page 20 or 30. And I'm going to read, a s if I can find it. Let's see, I can look up where it is. There we go. I'm going to read um, from Julia's second wedding. And this is about, just to prepare you, it's about eight pages. And then that will be that. And then we can do can try to answer any questions you have. <coughs> this is in the first person. Almost all of the books in the third person, which probably is also why I feel a different closeness to this book, but that's a different story. Um, this happens to be an exception. This is a, um, in the first person. A clause near the end of our legal divorce agreement stated that should either of us have more children, the children we had together would be treated no less favorably financially, either in life or in our wills. Despite all the longer thorns, and there were many, this one dug into Julia. But rather than acknowledge what at the time I assumed was the source of her distress, that because of our ages having more children was realistic only for me, she attached herself to the issue that wasn't even there. I would never in a million years remarry, she told the mediator. Well, this doesn't concern remarriage, but rather having children. If I were to have more children, which I will not, it would be in the context of a marriage which is not going to happen. Life is long, he said. Yeah, and the universe is even bigger, but we don't seem to be getting a lot of visits from intelligent life. And it's not long, Julia said. If life were long, I wouldn't be halfway through it. We aren't halfway through it, I said. You aren't, because you're a man. Women live longer than men. And she said, only technically. As ever, the mediator wouldn't take the bait. He cleared his throat, as if swinging a machete to clear a path through our overgrown history and said, this clause, which I should say is entirely standard for agreements like yours, won't affect you in the event that you don't have any more children. It merely protects you and your children if Jacob does. I don't want it in there, she said. Can't we move on to something genuinely contentious, I suggested. No, she said, I don't want it in there. Even if that means forfeiting your legal protection, the me mediator asked. And she said, I trust Jacob not to treat other children more favorably than ours. Life is long, I said winking at the mediator without moving an eyelid. Is that some kind of joke, she asked. Obviously, I said. The mediator cleared his throat again and drew a line through the claws. Julia wouldn't let it go, not even after we'd removed what wasn't there to begin with. In the middle of a discussion of something entirely unrelated, like how to handle Thanksgiving, Halloween, and birthdays, or whether it was necessary to legally forbid the presence of a Christmas tree in either's home, <laughs> she might say, Divorce gets an unfair rap. It was marriage that did this. Such out-of-context statements became part of the routine, at once impossible to anticipate and unsurprising. The mediator showed an almost autistic patience for her, for her teretic eruptions, until one afternoon, when splitting the hairs of medical decision-making in the event that one parent couldn't be reached, she said, I will literally die before I remarry. And then, without clearing his throat or missing a beat, he asked, do you want me to put in some language, language legally codifying that? 
She started dating Daniel about three years after the divorce. To my knowledge, which was greatly limited by the kindness of kids who were trying to protect me, she didn't date very much before him. She seemed to relish the quiet and aloneness, just as she'd always said, and I'd never believed she would. Her architecture practice flowered. Two of her houses were built, one in Bethesda, one on the shore, and she got a commission to convert a grand DuPont Circle mansion into a museum showcasing the contemporary art collection of a local supermarket oligarch. Benji, that's the youngest child, who was no less kind than his brothers but far less psychologically sophisticated, would increasingly mention Daniel, usually in the context of his ability to edit movies on his laptop. That humble skill, which could be learned in an afternoon by someone willing to, vote to, to devote an afternoon to learning it, dramatically changed Benji's life. All of the babyish movies that he'd been making on the waterproof digital camera that I got him, two Hanukkahs before, were suddenly brought to life as fully realized adult films. I never suggested that the camera stay at my house, and we never corrected his terminology. Once, when I was dropping the boys back at Julia's after a particularly fun weekend of adventures I'd spent the previous two weeks planning, Benji grabbed at my leg and said, you have to go, and I told him I did, but that he was going to have a great time and we'd see each other again in just a couple of days. He turned to Julia and asked, is Daniel here? He's at a meeting, she said, but he'll be back any minute. Oh, another meeting? I want to make an adult film. When my car rounded the corner, I saw a man about my age in clothing I might wear, sitting on a bench, no reading material, no purpose, but to wait. I knew that he went on the safari with them. I knew that he took Max to Wizards games. At some point he moved in, I don't know when, it was never presented to me as news. What does Daniel even do? I asked the boys one night over Indian. We ate out a lot in those days because it was hard for me to find the necessary time to grocery shop and cook, but more because I was obsessed with proving to them that we could still have fun, and eating out is fun, until someone asks, where are we having dinner tonight, at which point it begins to feel depressing. He's a scientist, Sam said, but not like a Nobel Prize winner or anything, Max said, just a scientist. <laughs> well, what kind of scientist? Don't know, Sam and Max said at the same time, but no one said jinx. He's an astrophysicist, Benji said. And then, are you sad? <laughs> Am I sad that he's an astrophysicist? Yeah. Julia asked a few times if I would go out for a drink with him, get to know him. She said it would mean a lot to her and to Daniel, and that it could only be good for the boys. And I told her, of course. I told her, it sounds great. And I believed myself as I said it, but it never happened. As we were saying goodbye after one of Max's teacher conferences, she told me that she and Daniel were going to get married. Does this mean you're dead? excuse me? You know, you would sooner die than remarry? She laughed. No, not dead. Reincarnated. As yourself? As myself plus time. Well, myself plus time is my father, I said. And she laughed again. Was her laugh spontaneous or generous? The nice thing about reincarnation is that life becomes a process rather than an event. Wait a minute. You're serious? That's just stuff from yoga, she said. Well, it flies in the face of stuff from science, I said. And she said, you're constantly coming back, Jacob, but you, you're always coming back as yourself. I didn't ask if the kids knew before me, and if so, for how long. She didn't tell me when it was going to happen or if I was going to be invited. I asked, does this mean that I'm going to be treated less favorably? She laughed. I hugged her. I told her how happy I was for her. And then I went home and ordered a video game system, as we'd always agreed we wouldn't. The wedding was three months later and I was invited and the kids did know before me, but only by a day. I told them not to mention the video game system to her and that was the actual sin. I can't help but compare it to our wedding. There are fewer people, but many of the same people. What did they think when they saw me? Those who had the guts to approach either pretended that there was nothing remotely awkward going on, that we were simply making small talk at the wedding of a mutual friend, or they put their hands on my shoulder. Julia and I were always good at catching eyes, even after the divorce. We just had a way of finding each other. It became a joke between us. How will I find you in the theater? By being you. But it didn't happen once all afternoon. She was preoccupied, but she must also have been keeping track of where I was. I thought about slipping out at various points, but that was not to be done. The boys gave a charming speech together. I asked for red. Daniel spoke thoughtfully and lovingly. He thanked me for being there, for welcoming him, 
I nodded, I smiled, he moved on, I asked for red. I watched the hoe from my table, watched the boys lift their mother in the chair as she was laughing so hard, and I was sure that with her up at that vantage we would definitely catch eyes, but we didn't. A salad was placed in front of me. Julia and Daniel went from table to table to make sure they said hello to every guest and for pictures. I saw it approaching, like a wave at a Nats game, and there was nothing to do but participate. I stood at the margin. The photographer said, say mocha, which I did not. He took it three times to be sure. Julia whispered to Daniel, gave him a kiss. He walked off, and she took the seat beside me. I'm glad you came. Of course. No, not of course. It was a choice that you made, and I know it's not uncomplicated. I'm glad you wanted me here. Are you okay? She asked. Very much so, I said. Okay. I looked around the room. The doomed flowers, the sweating water glasses, lipstick and purses left on chairs, guitars becoming detuned against speakers, knives that had attended thousands of unions. You want to hear something sad? I said. You know, I always thought I was the happy one, or the happier one, I should probably say. I never thought of myself as happy. You want to hear something even sadder? She said. I thought I was the unhappy one. I guess we were both wrong, I said. No, she said. We were both right, but only in the context of our marriage. I put my hands on my knees as if to further ground myself. I said, were you there when my dad said that thing about how without context we'd all be monsters? I don't think so, or I don't remember it. Well, our context made monsters of us. No, not monsters, she said. We were good, and we raised three amazing kids. Yeah, now you're happy, and I'm still me. Life is long, she said, trusting me to remember. The universe is bigger, I said, proving myself. And then sea bass was placed in front of me. And I picked up my fork so as to touch something. And I said, can I ask you a question? Sure. What do you tell people when they ask why we got divorced? It's been a long time since anyone has. Well, what did you used to tell them? I guess that we realized we were just really good friends and good co-parents. Aren't those reasons not to get divorced? (laughs) She smiled and said, I had a hard time explaining it. Me too, I said. I always sounded like I was hiding something or guilty about something or just fickle. Well, it's not really anyone else's business. So I asked, what do you tell yourself? It's been a long time since I asked myself. So what did you used to tell yourself? She picked up my spoon and said, we got divorced because that's what we did. It's not a tautology. While the waiters were bringing dinner to the, final t- to the final tables, the first tables were being brought dessert. And the boys, I asked, how did you explain it to them? They never really asked me. Sometimes they'd trace the outline, but they'd never enter. How about with you? Never once, I said. Isn't that odd? No, she said, a bride in her dress. It's not odd at all. I looked at the boys, being silly children on the dance floor, and I said, why did we put them in the position of having to ask? And she said, our love for them got in the way of being good parents. And then I ran my finger around the rim of my glass, but no music came. And I said, I would be a much, 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 much better father if I could do it again. You can, she said. No, I'm not going to have any more kids. I know, she said. And I don't have a time machine. I know, she said. And I don't believe in reincarnation. I know. Do you think that we could have made it, I asked, if we tried harder or gone back into things? Made what? life we made three lives she said yeah but could we have made one well is that the question Mm, why not making it not failing there are more ambitious things to do with life are there i hope so on the drive to the party i'd listened to a podcast about asteroids and how unprepared we are for the possibility of one heading toward us the physicist being interviewed explained why none of the possible contingencies would work Nuking it would just turn a cosmic cannonball into cosmic buckshot, and the debris would likely reform in a few hours due to gravity. Robotic landers could deflect the asteroid with mounted thrusters if such things existed, which they don't and won't. Similarly implausible would be sending up an enormous spacecraft as a gravity tractor, using its own mass to pull the asteroid away from Earth. So what would we do? The host asked. Probably nuke it, the physicist said. But you just said it would only break it into lots of asteroids that would hit us. That's right. So it wouldn't work. Almost certainly not, the physicist said. But it would be our best hope. 
our best hope. The expression didn't awaken anything me, in me at the time. It took Julia's hope, attaching itself to the other terminal of my mind, to jumpstart my sadness. I said, remember when I smashed the light bulb at our wedding? Are you really asking me that? What? Did you like that moment? That's a funny question, she said, but yes, I did. Me too. She said, I don't even know what it's supposed to symbolize. I'm glad you asked, I said. And she said, I knew you would be. So, I said, assuming my position, some people think it's to remind us of all the destruction that was necessary to bring us to the moment of our greatest happiness. Some people think it's a kind of prayer. Let us be happy until the shards of this light bulb reassemble. Some people think it's a symbol of fragility. But the interpretation I've never heard is the most straightforward one. This is what we're like. We're broken individuals committing to what will be a broken union in a broken world. She said, it is less inspiring your way. <laughs> it's not, I thought. It's more inspiring my way. But what I said was, there's nothing more whole than a broken heart. Is that Dr. Silvers, she asked. That's his therapist who he's constantly referencing, much to everybody's consternation. In fact, I said, it's the Kotzker Rebbe. Listen to you. Yeah, I've been studying with the rabbi who did my grandfather's funeral. Curiosity converted the cat. Meow. Meowzeltov, I said. <laughs> How I loved her laugh. I looked at Julia. And in that moment, I knew we never could have made it. But I also knew that she had been my best hope. Isn't it strange, I said? We had 16 years together. They felt like everything when we were in them. But as time passes, they'll account for less and less of our lives. And then all of that everything will have been a what? A, like a chapter. That's not how I think about it. She tucked her hair behind her ears. I'd seen her do tens of thousands of times. And I asked, why are you crying? Why am I crying? Why aren't you crying? This is life. I'm crying because this is my life. And just as the sound of the scooper going into Argus's dog food used to bring him running from wherever he was in the house, the boy seemed almost telepathically drawn to their mother's tears. Why is everyone crying? Sam asked. Did someone win a gold medal? <laughs> Are you sad? Benji asked me. You don't have to worry about me, I told him. It's okay, Julia said. Just let it be okay. There was nothing more painful than being the center of attention at my wife's wedding, <laughs> save for continuing to think of her as my wife. Are you overjoyed? Max asked, handing Benji the maraschino cherry from his Shirley Temple. No. Are you flabbergasted or cattywampused or perhaps diaphanous? I laughed. So what? Sam asked. What? What was that feeling? What was my feeling? I said, remember when we talked about absolute value, I think for physics maybe? It was math, Sam said. Yeah. And do you remember what it is? It's distance from zero. I have no idea what you're talking about, Benji said. <laughs> Julia pulled him onto her lap and said, neither do I. I said, sometimes feelings are like that. Not positive, not negative, just a lot. No one had any idea what I was talking about. I didn't know what I was talking about. I wished I could get Dr. Silvers on the phone, put him on speaker, and ask him to explain me to myself and to my family. After the divorce, I had a series of brief relationships. I was lucky to have met those women. They were smart, strong, fun, and giving. My explanations of what went wrong always came down to an inability to live fully honestly with them. Dr. Silvers pushed me to explore what I meant by full honesty. But he never challenged my reasoning, never suggested that I was self-sabotaging or creating definitions that were impossible to meet. He respected me while feeling sorry for me, or that's what I wanted him to feel. It'd be very difficult to live like that, he told me, fully honestly. I know, I said. You'd not only open yourself to a great deal of hurt, you'd have to inflict a great deal of hurt. I know. And I don't believe that it would make you happier. I don't either, I said. He swiveled his chair and looked out the window, as he often did when thinking, as if wisdom could be found only in the distance. He swiveled back and said, but if you were able to live like that. And then he stopped. He removed his glasses. In my 20 years of knowing him, it was the only time he'd ever removed his glasses. He held the bridge of his nose between his thumb and forefinger. And he said, if you were able to live like that, then our work here would be finished. I was never able to live like that. But our work finished a year later when he had a fatal heart attack while jogging. I got a call from one of the therapists who had an office in the same suite. She invited me to come and talk about it, but I didn't want to talk to her. 
I wanted to talk to him. I felt betrayed. He should have delivered the news of his death. <laughs> and I should have delivered the news of my sadness to the kids. But just as his death precluded Dr. Silver's from sharing his death with me, my sadness kept my sadness from them. The band members had assumed their positions and forgoing any musical foreplay went straight into dancing on the ceiling. The sea bass that was once in front of me no longer was. It must have been taken away. The glass of wine that was once in front of me no longer was. I must have drunk it. The boys ran to the dance floor. I'll just slip out, I told Julia. When we visited Masada, my father filled his pockets with rocks, and without knowing what he was doing, knowing only my need for his approval, I filled mine. My uncle Shlomo told us to put them back. It was the first time I'd ever heard him say no to any one of us. He said that if everyone took a rock, Masada would be dispersed across mantles and bookshelves and coffee tables, and there'd be no Masada. Even as a boy, I knew that was ridiculous. If anything is permanent, a mountain is. I'll just slip out, I said. And then I walked to my car, beneath the sky clotted with near-earth objects. Somewhere in the wedding guest book are my children's signatures. They developed their handwriting on their own, but I gave them their names. Thank you. Thank you. I loved your book. Thank you. I, I'm one of those people who kind of been, I switch between digital or uh, reading on my Kindle or buying them, and some I listen to on audio. This one happened to be. I'll, oh, I'll sorry. Repeat, I'll repeat it if you want. But sorry, I happened to listen to this book on an audio audio book instead of reading it, and I actually found I was really glad that I did because I loved the voices that they used, especially Jacob's. Well, obviously, the two main ones are Jacob's father and the grandfather and I was curious if you had any say in that or any input in how that happened not only did I not have any say in it I haven't listened to it um, <laughs> not for any reason other than that I would find it I tend not to listen to my you know voice on answering machines either it's just <laughs> awkward um, I think it's probably another issue of closeness or um, do you know what the uncanny valley is have you ever heard about that has anybody ever heard about the uncanny valley it's a term from um, I guess it originated in, in robotics or maybe in animation. And it's basically the idea that as a representation of a human becomes more and more and more lifelike, um, we can approach um, a degree of like realisticness or verisimilitude that we, we don't like and it repulses us. So we like it when it is a perfect representation or it feels perfectly accurate, like the Mona Lisa. And we like it when it's very obviously not human, even if it's depicting a human, like um, Pixar cartoons, for example. But what we don't like is when it gets awfully close, but isn't close enough. And there are some famous examples of it, like the movie Polar Express, um, which completely bombed. And not only did it bomb, people were really repulsed by it. They hated the movie in a way that the movie's content just wouldn't justify. Um, and the, the kind of accepted theory is that it's because it fell into this uncanny valley where it was awfully like the real thing, but not real enough and not distant enough from the real thing to allow us to know that it was artificial. And it's something that like, um, animators and designers of robots are thinking about all the time. I think hearing, uh, the audiobook would fall into the uncanny valley for me. It's like, it's awfully close to what I had in mind. Obviously, the words are all in the right place. But as you just heard, I have a certain way of doing it. Like, there's a way that I imagine it being articulated. And differences from that way I don't want to encounter because it will <laughs> it'll be repulsive to me. I'm happier having no exposure to it at all um, that, that I am comfortable with. Hi. If I understood you correctly, this is the book you felt most at home with. Uh, and your last chapter, I th if I remember, is called Home in the book. <coughs> uh, and you compared that to the context of your other two books. So I, I, and I particularly, you know, was in love with Oscar. But so the, the question I have is, what is it uh, that made you think of this as feeling home in the first place and 
given that, why do you not feel as home in your other books? Well, that's a complicated question. First of all, I might have answered it differently after I wrote the book. When I was at that distance that I am now, a year after I wrote the book, I might very well, I can't remember, honestly, but at that time, I might very well have said, yeah, this is great. I feel at home here. Um, you know, it's a little bit like clothing, you know, I could try to f put on clothing that I wore when I was 11. I could probably fit a couple of my limbs into it. I could definitely take it to a tailor and say, could you please make this fit me now? But the tailor would look at me like I was crazy. He'd be like, just, just go buy some new clothing. And books are like that. It's like I was saying, there's this time when you are a writer of a book. There's a time when you're both the writer and reader of the book, and then you're the reader of the book. And once you're the reader of the book, you're kind of growing, I, I am growing away from it. Um, but I think there is maybe another answer, which is, and I should also say, my feeling at home in it has nothing in the world to do with your feeling at home in it. There are parts, I mean, I can't, it happens so often that when somebody will tell me, oh, this part of the book meant so much to me and I will not even remember that it was in the book. It was not, and there are other parts that I slaved over and felt so, I felt like I got it just right that nobody notices or remembers. Um, but th th my first two books, it's interesting you pointed out, Oscar, my first two books have very strong first person narrators. You know, everything is illuminated is, there's a, a, literally a guide who guides you through the book, who's Alex and he has this very particular and kind of muscular way of speaking. I imagine that for people who've read that book, if you were to say, tell me something about it, they'd probably start by saying something about Alex and the way that he talks. Um, and Oscar is a very domineering, in a good way, personality who presides over the second book. Most people who are going to talk about it will s probably start by talking about Oscar. This book is the first one I've ever written that's entirely in the third or almost entirely in the third person, all but 40 pages, let's say. And yet it's not a third person without a personality. You know, it, it's a third person that has a kind of sense of humor, that has a kind of political perspective, even if it can't quite be pinned down, that has a rhythm to like thoughts and feelings, that has a sensibility. And so who is that third person? It's not really me, but it is something like me. And this is the first book I've, you know, I wrote a nonfiction book that was in the first person. I was talking about my own life and experiences. But this is the first book I've ever written where people I know say to me, this one sounds like you. You know, I've n I'd never heard that before. This book sounds like you. Um, that has nothing to do with the quality. It might, it, my instinct is it's, a, it's not a good idea to pursue that um, any more than it's a good idea to pursue anything. I don't pursue things when I write. Um, because then I would be committing to ideas that maybe a different version of me living in a different version of this world had a year or two years or ten years ago that no longer fit, you know, like the clothing. Um, so I try to keep it... I mean, I can tell you how I work in the course of each day, which might better explain it than my kind of speaking abstractly about it. So at least for this book, when I would wake up, I would sit down at my computer and I would begin the day by asking myself, what am I thinking about right now? Not where does the book need to get to, not what, what work needs to be accomplished, but just what am I thinking about? And oftentimes, if I simply asked myself the question, I would have an answer. If I didn't ask myself the question, I wouldn't sit down and notice that I was thinking about something, but which is a like a very powerful fact in and of itself. Like simply asking the question can reveal your own thoughts and feelings. And I'd ask, what am I thinking about? And oftentimes I would have an answer. Oftentimes I wouldn't. And then I'd just kind of look around the room and look around the inside of my head and something would stand out like if i had to do it right now i don't know maybe i would th you know what I, the first thing i would think of is this jar of pens here because i would remember when i visited joseph brodsky's grave in venice where people leave pens in a jar sort of like this and i would think about that then 
just why are people leaving pens? Do they think he's going to write with them? No. <laughs> then they should really put them in the ground. Um, it's a tribute, but to whom? Like to the person they're being left for, or to the person who's leaving it? Uh, and do the pens dry up just as his blood dries up over time? Do they leak out? Like, what is the relationship physically between what happens to the pens and what happens to his body? I would just do that for a little while. Maybe I'd read about pens. I'd research pens. Or I'd read about what happens to a decomposing poet. <laughs> you know? I don't know. Um, but I would work on it for a bit until I felt that I couldn't, there was no more, I was having no, it was not productive any longer. And then I'd put it to the side and I'd go back to what I had been working on the day before. So let's say it's a 50 page chapter and I'd start at the beginning and read through it. Every day I always start at the beginning and read through what I'm working on and edit it as I go. So I don't have first draft, second drafts, third drafts. I really have one draft, but in the course of writing that draft, I'm constantly, it's like at the Golden Gate Bridge where when the painters reach the end, they have to go back to the beginning because it's time to start painting the beginning again because of the quality of the air. Um, I'm always going back to the beginning. And I work on that for a couple of hours, four hours. And then at the, right when my work day is about to be, finished, I go back to the pens and the jar, and I'll look at it differently this time, and I'll say, is this useful? This thing whose entire function was to be useless, now I ask if it was useful. And when I'm in the beginning of writing a book, and I don't really know what it's about, and I don't know what the themes are, and I don't know, it's often useless. And I put it aside, I have a file on my computer where I keep them. As I get toward the end of the book, almost every single day I end up keeping them. And if you were to read this book now with the knowledge of what I just told you, I bet you could find a lot of such things where you would say, I wonder if that's one of those things. Like the asteroid I just read is one of those things. I had heard something about asteroids on the radio like the day before. I made a little mental note and the next morning I thought I'm gonna try to write about asteroids. And then I did and then lo and behold, there's a perfection to it. And it's a, there's a perfection to it because it couldn't have been intended. Brodsky, the poet, whose peop people leave pens on his grave, said that the rhyme is smarter than the poet. And, you know, I think what he meant was that people write in verse not only because it's pretty, which it is, but because it creates regular problems that require solutions. Um, and the solutions are more interesting than what you would have done if you'd been unconstrained. So if I want to say something about a fallen leaf, what are the odds that I'm going to find something original and beautiful to say about it? I would say they are verging on zero. But if I suddenly have to say something that ends, the thought ends with a word that rhymes with, you know, rubber band, then that's a real problem. And the contortions that I will make to solve that problem are going, the odds of that being interesting and original are much, much greater, even if they're still small. So by that writing process that I have where I then revisit that kind of unselfconscious or subconscious bit of writing from the morning, it's like having a problem to solve. Like, what's going on here? Why would my head think about this? There is some reason. I don't know what it is. I don't know what the function of dreams are. But I know that, I know that there's something to them. And even if dreams themselves are kind of mental garbage, the interpretation of dreams is not mental, is not garbage. It's rich, it's interesting. And so revisiting that work from the beginning of the morning is like trying to solve a problem. Like what do these pens have to do with everything? Is there a character in the book they have to do with? There is a, there actually is a like talk of a decomposing body at one point. It has to do that. Jacob is a writer, so maybe it has to do with that. Not sure, but th that is always the writing that I'm most proud of. And it's kind of ironic because it's the writing that I'm least responsible for. Uh, thank you for writing great books. And my question is kind of a merger of the two former questions. So those, the first two books were, as you said, very exuberant. And it's very obvious that the characters, you love those two characters. They're really great. And um, with your book, I read it as a traditional paper book. And I didn't really know whether I liked the two main characters or not. They went back and forth with me. They made me really mad sometimes. <laughs> but as you read it, I really liked those characters. <laughs> so did you like them all the time, or did you just go back and forth with whether you liked them or not? I've never met anybody that I liked all the time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and no, it's true. It doesn't make me 
curmudgeonly. Have you? Do you is there anybody you like all the time? <laughs> all the time? Um, so, you know, one can choose. There are a lot of choices that you have when you write a book. You could write something that is unlike the world for some reason. And there are good reasons to do that. Or you can write something that is like the world. And there are good reasons to do that. I think I was more interested with this book than my previous books to write something that is like the world. There's a scene in the book where a father, Jacob's father takes Jacob to the Museum of Natural History. And they have a kind of discussion about, and this was a perfect example of something that I wrote without any intentions, not knowing what the point was going to be. But it ended up having a use. Um, and the father explains to Jacob, when Jacob is a boy, that the animals are positioned as they are, not only because it's attractive, and it creates these sort of dramatic nature scenes, but um, they they aim the wounds away from the viewer, you know, the bullet hole or the knife hole, whatever. And he says, you know, these things, it's not like these were, they don't, these animals don't, the bison didn't die of natural causes. It didn't die of cancer. Like, <laughs> someone hunted it for the purpose of it being here. But we try to conceal that in order to present the more attractive side. And, but if one chooses to be, you can be aware of the history that brought the thing to you. And this book is very invested in the histories that brought these characters to where they are and in showing that other side, you know, showing the wounds. And it's, it is not as attractive. Like, there's another way I could have positioned these characters. Like, they didn't always have to say the thing where you think like, oh, Jacob in particular does that a lot. Like, do you have to say that thing? Like, or just do it, Jacob. I found myself often thinking that. Like, there's the moment when he's on the phone trying to rescue Sam's avatar. And the person on the phone is like, it's going to cost this amount of money. You're like, just do it. You know, just do it. And man, oh man, that is like my response to the way Jacob lives. Constantly, just do it. Just do it. Just do it. Um, but he can't. And I think that that is what makes him frustrating and also rich. Earlier in your talk, you mentioned that there are works of art, books or whatever, that you really like and those that you love. Could you sh would you be willing to share with us some of the ones you love? Sure. Um, well, I mentioned Joseph Cornell earlier, and he's really the artist who, the first artist I ever loved. And the first artist that revealed to me that I could love a work of art. Because I had previously thought, when you say you love something, you really just mean, of what I know, this is the one I like best. Which is a pretty, um, it's not a very ambitious definition of love. You know, if you were to go to a party and walk around and say like, eh, this is the person I'm, I've had the best conversation with, I guess I'm in love with this person. You know, <laughs> it's not, nobody wants to have that, to walk around with that definition and but it was the definition I had with art until I encountered something that I really loved and how what made me feel that I loved it it was this this kind of quality of being known like I mean first of all it was the feeling that like wait a minute didn't I make that you know how did he make that because I made that oh no I didn't make that I just have the feeling that I made that and he created that feeling inside of me but I would sure like to make something like that and what I, I remember having that feeling and when I was younger what I thought that meant or my only way to explore that feeling was just to imitate so like a lot of young artists I just imitated the things that I love and then as I got a little bit older I realized the thing that I wanted to imitate was not the work but the feeling that it evoked in me like wow I would like to have somebody else feel I would like to make something that made somebody else feel known in the way that this makes me feel known so he's an example. Um, there's a book by a woman named Charlotte Solomon. It's called Life or Theater. It's out of print. I came upon it. I was in Amsterdam. I was lost. I wandered into a museum, and there was, um, I think, to go to the bathroom. And there was um, the site of so many great revelations, by the way. But there was, <laughs> on, the, on the walls of the museum, this artwork. So the book is like 750 watercolors that have text incorporated into them. She died when she was, I should know exactly how old she was, but I want to say late 20s, mid 20s, died in the war. And um, people often refer to it as a complete work of art. They say if it had only been a text, it would have been one of the great novels of the century. If it had only been a work of visual art, it would have been one of the great visual works of visual art of the century. And 
in a v in a mysterious way, it just moves me really quite deeply. Um, I watched the other day a movie called um, for the second time called The Trip, and there's a, a sequel called The Trip to Italy with Steve Coogan, which it, the, a description of it would make you think, why would I ever want to watch that? And I found myself incredibly moved by it. I thought it was an absolutely beautiful, deep, like existential in all the best ways, um, film. Uh, Thank you. There, there are a few examples, and I guess that's the point. I think this has to be the last question, or I don't know how much time there is. Okay. Okay. An easy question: Is your title a, a reference to the Old Testament? It is. So here I am. Um, I'm going to try to answer this quickly. It, it refers to the binding of a scene in Genesis, the binding of Isaac, which begins. And then God put Abraham to the test. He said, Abraham, Abraham said, here I am. And then God said, I need you to sacrifice your beloved son. And so the sort of accepted um, understanding of the test was the sacrifice. But you could also read it as, and then God put Abraham to the test. He said, Abraham, and that that was the test. You know, how will you respond when I call for you? And Abraham does not respond by saying, I just need a couple minutes. Let me finish this up. Or like, <laughs> my ramen's almost ready. Hold on. Or like, what is it that you need? He responds with this unconditional presence without any reservations just, and, and a complete presence. All of it. Here I am. And then a few sentences later, when Isaac, when, excuse me, when Abraham is leading Isaac up Mount Moriah for the sacrifice, and Isaac starts to sense something's a little weird here because we have the logs, we have the matches or whatever they had back then, um, but we don't have an animal. Am I the animal? Uh, and he says, my father, and Abraham says, here I am, hineni, which is a word that's only used a few times in the Torah. And it's a very poignant moment. Both of them are poignant moments, but together they're especially poignant because it's paradoxical. You cannot be fully unconditionally present for God who wants you to kill your son while being fully and unconditionally present for your son who doesn't want to be sacrificed. Um, it's a real problem. And, you know, people in this room don't experience problems on that scale, but we do experience, I think, all of us, these paradoxes of identity or an inability to be completely there in, for two different situations or identities or contexts or people. Um, sometimes people feel that friction between um, religious values and, or, and secular values. Some people find it between being a professional and a parent. You know, I've been on this little book tour. I missed a violin recital. I missed a baseball playoff game. But, okay, I have a job, and I have to also do this. And sometimes I don't do things for my professional life because I want to be home for dinner that night. Um, people feel a friction between being a spouse and being an individual in the world. Um, they're all kinds of different versions, and they're not enormously problematic or destructive. They just require a lot of balancing. But sometimes they are destructive and problematic, and that's when a crisis forces a choice, forces you to say, here I am at the expense of this other place. And the book is organized around these two crises, which force Jacob especially, but really all the characters, to claim an ultimate identity. You know, I can no longer be inside the marriage and outside the marriage, inside the family and outside the family. I have to choose. And I can no longer, with regard to Israel, have these, this kind of conflicted identity where I'm one person at a cocktail party and I'm a different person when hanging out with my Jewish friends um, and a different person in private. Uh, so that, that is what the here I am means. Okay, last question. Um, <clears throat> this is about uh, your approach to writing. Uh, I've heard some writers say that they need to know what is going to happen on the last page of the book before they start. They need to, they need to know what the last scene is. I, I, I'm just wondering how much of the sort of story architecture do you have in mind when you begin uh, a, a book? Or, or do you not know where the book's going to go? I, I've written, I think, three book proposals in my life, or maybe four, and I've only turned in one of the books that I sold, which was my nonfiction book, Eating Animals. I've never turned in a novel that I said I was going to turn in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if I were to say to you, do you need to know how this year is going to end? 
in order to have a happy year. You could say there are ways I would like for it to end. There are things that I can imagine and hope for. But that kind of attachment to an outcome, first of all, is silly because it doesn't take into account the fact that all kinds of things are going to happen that you couldn't possibly predict now. And it also might actually preclude a happy year, like a kind of vigilant attachment to some outcome in particular. There's a magician in this book. I almost read this passage, but just chose not to at the last second, who Jacob asks, what happens if a trick gets screwed up? I've always wondered, like, what happens if, and the magician's like, how would a trick get screwed up? And he says, well, what if someone lies about the card that they picked? Or what if you drop the deck on the floor? Or, and the magician says, well, I never perform a trick. I only perform a process. There's no specific outcome that I need. It can go a lot of different ways. And when I write, I, I try to perform a process and not a trick. So I never have an outline. I don't even know what I'm going to do on a given day, mm. much less for a whole project. Now, that changes over time because it, clearly there comes a point at which I do know what I'm working on. And when I do become attached to an outcome, I don't want to be 550 pages into a 570 odd page book and say, wouldn't it be great if they were all dwarves <laughs> and it took place on the North Pole? Um, but I, I really do my best and it's hard. It sounds a little bit like a naive process, but it's just the opposite. It's a, it requires a huge amount of will not to ask certain questions. Mm -hmm. Like, where is this going? Is this good? Is this smart? Is it funny? Mm -hmm. Will anybody like it? What's the point? That's the hardest one not to ask. Mm -hmm. But those are all, they're anti-creative. Because then all you're engaging with is the part of your mind that you have control over, which I'm not all that excited about. I, think I know that if I try to say the original thing about a shared experience, which are the only kinds of, ex first of all, they're the only kinds of experiences that there are but they're also the only kind of experiences that matter. I just can't do it. I don't have the ability on my own, but I can, I can um, set myself up in the way of these kind of fortuitous accidents or these rhymes that allow me to stumble upon things and say, hey, that's, you know, like this, I might very well go right about that. The pens and the, right. like I can see that becoming something. Why did it arise? I didn't have a good idea all day, by the way. If I have a good idea today, that will be the only one. Mm. And it arose because I put myself in the way of it. Because you asked a question, and rather than just giving an abstract answer, I said, all right, I'm going to look around the room and just force myself. I'm going to force myself. And so that process of forcing myself to engage with the parts that are unreasonable or that I can't, right. don't have control over, that's, not, that's the only path I now can see towards something that would make me proud. Thank you.